And now you've made it to the last input session of the day, which is going to be ethics and governance. Meredith. Indeed. So um, to be real about it, nothing we've spoken about doesn't touch ethics and governance. But right now we want to hit it on the nose. We want to get perspectives from across disciplines, history, art, philosophy, research, and just look at what are the limits and opportunities in our current definitions of of, of ethics and governance. So I would like to welcome to the stage Molly Steenson from Carnegie Mellon University to get us started. So when we look at AI and we look in the media, we see a lot of things, like AI is the new black, AI is the new UI, AI is the new electricity. And we might also hear things like, the future of computers is the mind of a toddler, if not a blue baby, or it might be a disembodied head. People like Elon Musk, we see him because tech, no, tech moguls are declaring an era of artificial intelligence. And I am even AI. The Grid.AI is a web design company that offers AI uh, services. And if you can read the small print, it's really offensive. Um, Golan Levin had a really great thing to say about how awful it is. And I also have this slide similar to Simone, which is when you Google what AI is, this is what it looks like. But the thing is that AI isn't the new anything because AI isn't new. And if we look back to its history, we could look, there are some, there are some definitions of AI that even harken back to the first, uh, the first century AD. But if we look at where it began to develop after World War II in the 1940s and coming out of cybernetics, we see a number of things. It was John McCarthy who, of course, coined the term artificial intelligence in 1956, talking about making machines do things that would re require intelligence if done by man. He convened a group of researchers at Dartmouth the summer of 56 to work on the agenda of what would be the platform of artificial intelligence. It was people including Marvin Minsky, Claude Shannon, Ross Ashby, of course, McCarthy himself, Frank Rosenblatt, Herb Simon, Alan Newell, and a number of others. These are still a lot of the platform of what we consider AI today. We talk a lot about learning when we're talking about AI, and notions of learning precede the coining of the term. So Alan Turing in 1950 um, wrote about simulating a child's brain rather than starting with the brain of, a, of an adult or looking at blank pages, thinking of blank pages in a journal that one might fill in. In 1952, when Arthur Samuel coined the term machine learning, and um, it was in order to look at simulations of things if done by human beings or animals would be described as involving the process of learning. How did he train it? Checkers. And just as an aside, the, the visuals in these articles are just unbelievably beautiful. Neural networks um, also have their start in this time period. In 1958, Frank Rosenblatt um, created the Perceptron, and it unleashed a media storm. The New York Times wrote about it and said that it would be an electronic computer that experts predicted would be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. This is, of course, Navy-funded. I'll get back to that in a second. This is something, though, that a decade later that Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert wanted to see an end be put to. They, put, they published a book called Perceptrons that argued that this line of research was effectively specious. They incorrectly uh, proved perceptrons wrong and, uh, as a result, cut off funding to an entire area of connectionist AI for decades. They later issued a, uh, an apology. And I want to point out that we are sitting in the legacy of uh, artificial intelligence. Of course, with someone like Marvin Minsky, who, who co-founded the AI lab here at MIT in 1969. Um, and of course, in the predecessor to uh, the Media Lab, the Architecture Machine Group, which was founded by Nicholas Negroponte in 1967 and which folded into the Media Lab when it was founded in 1984. One of the things that the Architecture Machine Group did, it was a group of architects and electrical engineers who worked closely together, tinkered with technology, and built interfaces for artificial intelligence. One of the things they did is worked very closely within the same funding structures of the AI lab and AI directives, such as with the Seek show, at, um, or the Seek project at the software show. This is a, a gerbils blocks world, a set of blocks 
a stacking arm, um, a video eye that Seymour Papert and Marvin Minsky had invented, and a set of gerbils that did what gerbils do, which is make a mess. Um, as Ted Nelson said about this, our bodies are hardware, our behavior software. Um, Seek was a disaster in certain ways, not least because it killed the gerbils. There are other projects later on as the funding climate for AI changed, like Aspen Movie Map or Mapping by Yourself, which look familiar to us today and are actually picking up with uh, command and control imperatives in the AI lab here at MIT at that time. I think that Nicholas Negroponte really understood what it was to be working with AI. In 1975, in his um, book, Soft Architecture Machines, he said that I strongly believe it is very important to play with these ideas scientifically and explore applications of machine intelligence that totter between being unbelievably oppressive, unimaginably oppressive, and unbelievably exciting. And this is about agendas, because these men set the agendas for AI. And this, this funding is a matter of defense funding. So someone like J.C.R. Licklider, whose notion of human-computer symbiosis was the operative idea for interactivity for decades, and still is. We could think of Karen Levy's talk earlier today. Someone like J.C.R. Licklider was Nicholas Negroponte's mentor, a professor here, the first director of the Information Processing Office, um, Information Processing Technology Office at DARPA, and also um, a private contractor with Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. Similarly, the Office of Naval Research funded the agenda for, for AI research, particularly through the vision of a man named Nar Marvin Denikoff, who Marvin Minsky once referred to as the grand old man of AI. This is what Paul Edwards has called the closed world, the circulation between the military-industrial comp complex and keeping knowledge within a tight group of people who enjoyed working together and funding. So what's at stake? AI isn't the new anything. But what's gained by saying that it is? AI is about building worlds. It's about modeling intelligence. In fact, it's about modeling ourselves. AI is about research funding, and it's about defense funding. It's about making new markets. It's about capital, and it's about power. The question here, I think, that we're all looking at today is what do we want AI to be about? And what do we want its agenda to be? I'm tired of seeing, whoa, well, we missed her for a second. I'll bring her back. Although, the, well, we'll stick with Oprah. <laughs> there are the cyborgs with jQuery across their faces. Everybody gets some machine learning. But I think what we need to be doing, and I think what we are doing here, is we're looking under the lid. We need to look back in time and open up the agendas because AI needs us. Thank you. Thank you, Molly.